mind has a habit of feeding on things. And for the most part, its feeding habits are pretty bad. It feeds on all the wrong things. And it suffers as a result. It's like a person who just takes anything at all and stuffs it in his mouth. sure to do all sorts of damage to his digestive system, to his body as a whole. But the feeding of the mind is more complex than the feeding of the body. It tries to feed on sensual things and they don't give any satisfaction. It tries to feed on becoming this or becoming that, and it doesn't last very long. And then it gets all disgusted with the whole thing and wants to destroy everything, and then it feeds on the idea of destroying. And then it doesn't have anything left. It has to start all over from scratch because it still needs to feed. It hasn't gotten over the, the need to get something inside. And part of the Buddha's genius was to realize that there are other ways of feeding the mind, ways of feeding the mind so it gets to the point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. That's what the path is all about. It's a different way to feed. The word for feeding and clinging are actually the same in the Pali, upadana, the things you take as sustenance for the mind. And basically what he has us do in the path is to take our old habits of feeding and feed in new ways. We still hold on, we still cling, but it's not quite the same as the clinging that causes us to suffer. In other words, we don't hold on to these things as ends in and of themselves. We hold on to them as a path, as tools. The Buddha allows for a certain amount of sensual pleasure in the path. He says, you look at your practice and you see that if you indulge in certain pleasures and it doesn't harm the mind, then it's okay. Some sensual pleasures, he says, are off bounds, that they can't be skillful in any by any stretch of the imagination. But in other cases, it really depends on the individual. Some people find that they can meditate perfectly well in busy surroundings. Other people really have to go off and live in the forest. Some people can find that they can eat a nice, moderate diet and there's no problem. Other people have to starve themselves. It's really an individual matter. But even when you starve yourself, the Buddha doesn't have you totally starve yourself. It simply means that you have to eat less than you normally might like. Because he realizes the body does need food to keep going. And the same with the other forms of clinging. Attachment to views. Well, he says there's right view. Right view is a view about karma to begin with. And it's interesting when the Buddha talks about karma, the first two things he focuses on are gratitude and generosity. If you don't see the virtue of the value of gratitude, you don't see the value of generosity, it's hard to do anything else in the path. In other words, you have to appreciate the good that other people have done for you and see that something really good does come from being generous. Generosity is not a sham. It's one of the things that makes life worth living. And if you don't appreciate the good that other people have done for you, the ways they've been generous, how are you going to be generous? How are you going to be a good person? This is why the Buddha has you reflect on gratitude and reflect on generosity as a very, the very basis for any kind of practice. From that point, right view moves on to an understanding about suffering, why we suffer, how we suffer, what we can do to put an end to suffering. That kind of view is a useful tool. Because its very nature is not to be taken to something as an end in and of itself. It's a means to put an end to suffering. 
it's a good view to feed on. Same with clinging to precepts and practices. The Buddha wasn't just talking about rituals, any type of practice, any type of precept, he said. If you take it as an end in and of itself, it's a kind of clinging and therefore it's suffering. But the path of practice, we have precepts, we have practices. You practice concentration. You maintain the precepts as means to an end. Because these kinds of precepts and practices really do nourish the mind. They strengthen you. If you know that under no circumstances would you ever kill, under no circumstances would, would you ever steal, there's a very strong sense of self-worth that comes from that. Someone comes and offers you a million dollars to lie, and you say no. It means you've got a precept that's worth more than a million dollars. And there's a sense of self-value that comes with that. And that's an important food for the mind. It really strengthens the mind to have a precept, to have a practice like that. And even views of the self. The Buddha doesn't have you totally drop any view of what you are or the fact that you have a self. You can create a sense of self as a strategy in lots of skillful or unskillful ways. And he recommends the skillful ways. Again, being generous, being virtuous, following the path, meditating. The kind of self that's responsible, the kind of self that can practice deferred gratification. Then when that sense of self is taking you as far as it can, then you realize it is a strategy, and there are times when that strategy doesn't work, so you drop it. You move beyond it. But again, you really need that kind of strategy to get anywhere on the path. So the Buddha teaches you to hold on to things as part of the path. The image he has is of a raft. You take the raft and you use it to get across the river. When you've gotten across the river, then you don't need the raft anymore. But while you're still on the river, you need the raft. Otherwise you drown. So make sure that this raft that you're taking here is well put together. This is why we spend so much time practicing the concentration, because this is the centerpiece of the path. It's by holding on to a good state of concentration that you can get across the river. So where is your concentration right now? How do you develop it? You give the mind something good to focus on, like the breath. And if the breath isn't enough, you can add the word butto together with the breath. It means awake. But with the in-breath, to with the out. No matter what else happens, there may be the sound of traffic way off in the distance, or music off in the distance, or pains in your legs or whatever. You just don't let that deter you. Don't let that distract you. Just stay here with the breath. Because those things don't really destroy the breath. Even though there may be noises off in the distance, you still got the breath right here. It's simply your choice where you're going to focus your attention. Focus it on something good. Focus it on good food, not on bad food. And do your best to give yourself a good foundation. Because of all the different elements of the path, this is the one the Buddha most often compares to food, a sense of stillness, a sense of well-being that you can create here in the present moment. It is a creation. It is something put together, which means that it's not the goal of the path, but it certainly is the path. So just stay with the breath. Feel the breath and the process of breathing. Where do you feel it? Where do you notice it? Where do it where you can see most vividly that now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. Well, focus right there. And then allow that part of the body to feel comfortable. You may notice at the end of a breath it tends to feel squeezed. Okay, that's a sign the breath is too long. Or if you've been breathing in and you don't quite feel full, well, allow the breath to get, breath to get longer. Learn to experiment to see what feels good right now, what feels right for the body right now. That makes the breath a lot more interesting and more useful as well.
If you can create a sense of well-being in the present moment, it's a lot easier to stay here for the whole hour. Then as you settle down with the breath, you begin to notice other parts of the body as well. You begin to realize that the whole body can be involved in the breathing process. There's energy throughout the whole body. To so make a survey of the body to see where there's tension. Is there any tension related to the in-breath? Are you holding on to tension with the out-breath in your hands, in your feet? Well, let them relax. You're working on your raft here, so make sure that it's a good raft. You don't want it to fall apart in midstream. Have some pride in your workmanship. The more attention you pay to the breath, the more you can feed off it, the, the more solid your foundation is the more trustworthy your raft. So think of any skill you've ever developed in the past and apply the same attitudes for developing this skill that you apply to your other skills. Pay careful attention to what you're doing. Try to notice even the slightest stress that you're causing, the slightest tension that you're creating in the process of breathing. And learn to let go of whatever it is that's causing that tension or causing that stress. If you find that too much to focus on right now, we'll just stay with a sense of any spot in the body where you can keep tabs on the breath and try to do your best to make it comfortable right there. Learn to be a connoisseur of your breathing. Okay, what kind of breathing really feels good right now? You're the one who decides. So experiment. Deep breathing might feel good for a while, and then you decide it doesn't feel so good anymore. Well, you can change. Pay attention to what you're doing with the breath. As with any craft, the more you pay attention to what you're doing, the better the results are going to be. This raft you have will become a good solid raft. One that doesn't fall apart is when the currents get strong, the kind of raft that can get you all the way across. If you want to think of it as food, okay, chew your food well. In other words, pay really close and careful attention to what you're doing. Don't just try to gulp it down. Choose good food, chew it well, and you find it gives you the strength that you need. You don't have to go feeding in other ways. You're learning new habits here, new ways of feeding the mind. And like any change in diet, in the beginning it may be a little hard. But as you get used to eating health food, after all, you, you look back at the old junk food you used to love and you realize you just can't stomach it anymore. Because the health food really does make your body healthier. And you realize that you craved junk food because you didn't know any better. And the junk food was actually making you crave more and more junk food. It was a vicious cycle. Now you're getting out of that cycle. You've got an alternative. Instead of gobbling down sensual pleasures and then getting sick of them and trying to trash anything, you've got an alternative way to feed, a way to feed that doesn't cause any harm to anybody. It gives you the strength until ultimately you get to the point where you don't have to feed anymore. The raft gets you all the way over to the other side. That's when it's done its task. Then you can really let go. But in the meantime, as long as you have to hold on, hold on to good things. That's the only way you're going to get across.